This is Zestology, new rules for living with energy, vitality and motivation. I'm Tony Wrighton. Today's podcast, all about gluten. I gave it up four years ago. Ever since, I feel like people slightly roll their eyes. Anyway, this podcast is all about gluten and wheat and what happens when you ingest it and grains in particular. With a man that I've wanted to speak to for a long time, Dr. William Davis. I read his book and it had a huge effect on me. I can't quite remember if that was the kind of tipping point in terms of giving up gluten, but it may well have been. It's a brilliant podcast, one of my favourites. The bit at the end about the miracle yoghurt you will love, as you will love the bit about vitamin D as well. I thought that was actually some of the best parts of the podcast, right at the end. But all of it is good, and here it is. Dr. William Davis on Zestology. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast and thank you for your book, which I read years ago and I've been gluten free for four years now. And it kind of gave me the nudge I needed because I always knew that when I had pasta or pizza or a beer, I had a dodgy belly afterwards. But I didn't quite take the plunge to eliminate gluten from my diet. So thanks for an amazing book. That's great, Tony. And of course, the gastrointestinal intolerance to grains, just the tip of the iceberg, goes far, far deeper than that. Well, that's that's one of the first things I wanted to ask you, actually, because, you know, some of my friends roll their eyes a little bit when I ask for the gluten free menu when I get in a restaurant and they're all like, look at me, mate. I'm having croissants for breakfast. And I've had a few beers tonight and I'm absolutely fine. And I find it quite hard to explain. So, yes, but Dr. William Davis said in his book that there's loads of toxins in gluten. So just tell us why you call it. Is it Franken gluten? Franken, Franken gluten? <laughs> Franken wheat, Franken grain. Frank, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, uh, uh, Tony, grains or seeds of grasses. That's I remind everyone. That's what grains are. They're seeds of grasses. Because when you remind everybody that we are told by our own governments and agencies uh, that uh, you know the Academy of Nutrition, Dietetics, American Heart Association, and their British counterparts, we're told that grains, seeds of grass, should dominate the human diet. Well, this is completely unprecedented. No wild living human population has ever done that. And they're pushing us to increase our consumption of the seeds of grass to 70% of all calories, which is, it, it's, it would be bad enough if they just said, you know, we're not sure where the humans should consume the seeds of grass because you don't have the digestive apparatus to break down the components of, of grasses and they make you quite ill. You could experience it as irritable bowel syndrome type symptoms, diarrhea and uh, gastric upset, etc. You could experience it as neurological impairment like cerebellar ataxia and you start walking into walls and wetting your pants at age 53. You could experience as type 2 diabetes. You could experience it as obesity. You could experience as rheumatoid arthritis or Hashimoto's thyroiditis or leg edema or hypertension or high triglycerides or high cholesterol. It shows up in so many different ways. And yet this is the food we're all told should increase in our diet, which is it's it's as if. We were told for lung health, Tony, you should smoke a minimum of a pack of cigarettes a day. It, it, it is that awful. Yet look how deeply it's infiltrated into our diet such that your friends give you, you know, the funny looks when you order for the gluten-free menu. <laughs> when you're the one who's doing, the way, doing it the way it was supposed to have been done all along. And, um, you know, I mean, I, I think a lot of people, not just my mates, but a lot of people will be listening to this and thinking, well, how can so many people get it wrong? And how can, how can the con- conventional medical establishment get it wrong? Because your message is quite different from theirs, isn't it? Yes. And, you know, when I first wrote the original Wheat Belly eight, nine years ago, uh, I kept on thinking, am I the idiot here? Am I the asshole? <laughs> am I the one who's <laughs> overlooking some crucial uh, uh, fact? And the actually opposite has proven true, Tony, that the deeper I dug, the worse it got. And it was clear that people who craft nutritional thinking were guilty of very, very basic logical uh, flaws. For instance, this is a very big one. If you replace something bad for health and replace it with something less bad and there's an apparent benefit, then you should not conclude by that, right? That a whole bunch less bad thing might, must therefore be good. For instance, if I replace 
full tar unfiltered cigarettes with filtered low tar <laughs> cigarettes and there's an apparent modest reduction in lung cancer and heart disease, should I therefore conclude that smoking a lot of filtered low tar cigarettes is therefore good? I mean, put in those terms, it seems yeah. stupid. Yeah. But that is the theme that winds over and over and over through nutritional thinking. Replace something bad with something less bad. Less bad must therefore be good. Whole grains, I'm sorry, white flour, bad. Whole grains, less bad. And those data are clear, 14 epidemiological observational studies that demonstrate that if you replace white flour products with an increasing quantity of whole grain products, there is less diabetes, type 2 diabetes, less obesity, less colon cancer, less heart disease. That's true. What they failed to recognize is what happens if you remove those things entirely, all grains. And those studies have been done. We don't have to do new studies. They've been done. And they show dramatic reductions in hemoglobin A1C, type 2 diabetes, autoimmune diseases, uh, numerous gastrointestinal problems. So the data already exists, but it's not popularized. It's not, I mean, aside from efforts like yours, your podcast, you know, you're not going to hear this on national TV because there's too much money involved. Well, you say Being that, but your your book was, I mean, did you have any idea? Because it was a New York Times bestseller, wasn't it? And did you have any idea how big it would be? No, I thought, I thought I'd just write it, maybe get a nice check, take my kids on a nice vacation. That'd be, be the end of it. <laughs> but it, it has, as you see, snowballed. And sadly, it's often heard as the gluten-free message. And as you know, you know, the gluten, we had to remind ourselves, Tony, that the gluten-free industry is also the grain industry. Yeah. So they're... They're not the smartest, but they're smart enough to recognize that this gluten-free message, if, if, if misinterpreted, is a win-win for them. Because gluten-free foods are made with cornstarch, rice flour, tapioca starch, and potato flour. Not all grains, but a substantial quantity of grain-sourced ingredients that are horrible absolutely horrible for health because they raise blood sugar. They cause all the consequences of glycation, like arthritis and cataracts and hypertension, heart disease, and dementia. <laughs> uh, and they, of course, they, they contributed dysbiosis, or disruptions of bowel flora. So uh, all, all you and I are trying to do, of course, is just get the real story out there because it's not coming from the National Health Service. It's not coming from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. It's not certainly not coming from my colleagues whose understanding of nutrition is about three pages long. I mean, they don't know anything about nutrition. If you want to learn about nutrition, don't go to the damn doctor. He doesn't know anything. He knows how to write prescriptions for you for drugs because that sexy sales rep told him to do that. Uh, or he knows how to dispense procedures, but he does not know how to dispense ideas that help your health. And that's why it's so important to support what things like you're doing, your podcast, because this is a message of health. I don't see any drug ads floating by as you talk. As you know, I'm on board with the gluten-free message and I have to say that it has suited me extremely well and I probably should have done it 10, 15, 20 years ago. There are plenty, the, the argument is though that uh, how can gluten be toxic and addictive now where 50 or 100 years ago hardly anyone was gluten-free and hardly anyone had problems with gluten. It was perfectly okay for them there. You, you saying that it's kind of, I'm eating naturally now the way I was supposed to be eating because I'm not eating gluten. But 50, 100 years ago, people seemed to eat it without much problem. Well, let, let's ask this question. Let's go all the way back to the first humans who consumed wild wheat, that is einkorn wheat, the 14 chromosome ancestor of modern wheat. Modern wheat is a 42 chromosome 18 inch tall semi dwarf strain, essentially created in a laboratory. So it's completely different chromosomally, genetically, biochemically, etc. But what if we went back to the primordial strain of wheat, einkorn, 14 chromosome, or even emmer, 28 chromosome plant that is the, bi uh, the wheat of the Bible? What happened to humans who were hunters, gatherers, who would kill their next meal, fish for it, spear it? Uh, club it on the head, uh, dig in the dirt for underground uh, tubers, uh, eat mushrooms, eat eggs, birds' eggs they'd find, gather bears, etc. When those people first turned to the seeds of grasses, in this case, einkorn, wheat, what happened to them? Likewise, millet in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, teacent and maize in Central America, what happened to those first humans? Well, the, the record is very clear, by the way. 
an explosion in tooth decay prior to the consumption of grains, one to three percent of all teeth recovered showed decay or abscess formation or misalignment. When we added grains in their various forms, and this occurred, oddly, occurred almost simultaneously worldwide in those different pockets. It's not quite clear why that was. It may have been a change in climate, as well as this incredibly successful thing we are called group hunters. And we wiped out many large populations of mammals, and food probably fell short uh, in short supply because of that. So when we turned to the seeds of grasses, what happened? An explosion in tooth decay. One to three percent of tooth uh, decay exploded to 16 to 49% of all teeth recovered, showing cavities, misalignment, abscess formation, uh, pre-mortem tooth loss, tooth loss before death. It also showed a doubling of knee arthritis, an explosion of iron deficiency. You see it in the bones as something called parotid hyperostosis. It's an overreaction of the bone marrow to, to, to make more blood because you don't have enough iron. Uh, men shrunk by five inches, women shrunk by three inches. That was a transient effect that only lasted a few thousand years. But in other words, when humans even turn to traditional wild strains of, of, uh, of grasses, seeds of grasses, we paid a huge health price. It keeps you alive. If, if you and I, Tony, were uh, starving and you had to feed your family and all you had was a loaf of bread or a field of, of grasses, you should eat it. But that's the price we pay. In order to survive another day or week or month, you pay this long-term health price, which could show as lupus, psoriasis, migraine headaches, Alzheimer's dementia, colon cancer, heart disease, type 2 diabetes, obesity, etc. So it, it is a trade-off we unwittingly made, near-term calories for lo a long-term disease. Now, right. what agribusiness did was they took traditional strains, that is 42 chromosome trigomestibum, that's what wheat is, and they changed it. So for instance, one glaring example is what BASF did, um, the world's largest chemical manufacturer. They had researchers at Oregon State University on the west coast of the US develop a strain of wheat called Clearfield wheat. They took semi-dwarf strains, 18-inch tall strains of wheat, and subjected it to a process called chemical mutagenesis. This is, by the way, prior to the age of genetic modification. This is, does not involve gene splicing. And I point that out because the wheat industry loves to say, Davis is crazy. We don't have any genetically modified wheat. They're playing a word game. They're, they're, all they're saying is no gene splicing techniques were used to generate some of these strains of wheat. The methods used to generate modern wheat were worse than genetic modification, far worse, such as chemical mutagenesis. In this case, the chemical sodium azide, a very toxic compound, was used to induce mutations in the wheat seed and embryo to make it resistant to an herbicide called amizomox. And so just like um, uh, uh, genetically modified corn, you spray amizomox all over your field, it kills the weeds, does not kill your wheat. Well, this is a problem because one, your wheat's now full of amizomox, Mm. this toxic uh, pesticide or herbicide, and, of course, the wheat has been completely changed. So the genetics of wheat today are nothing like the genetics of wheat in the past. And what they did was make it much more toxic, not because they're evil. They are evil people, but that's beside the point. They did it because <laughs> it raised yield per acre profits. They did it for agricultural reasons, increased yield, increased resistance to pests. For instance, there are two pest-resistant compounds in modern wheat, phytates and wheat germagglutinin. They're very good pest-resistant compounds. And so farmers, as well as geneticists, selected strains of wheat that were better at expressing lots, plenty of wheat germagglutinin phytates. But those are very toxic to humans. So they, they, they improved wheat for agricultural purposes and amplified the toxicity of, of wheat. And those are just two examples among many, many changed compounds in, in modern wheat. Wow. So you said that there's, there's a kind of this near term trade off between filling up your belly and the long term kind of deficit. But I was getting the near term problems as well. So some people have an immediate issue with wheat. And for others, they won't notice it in the short term. But a slice of cake may well prove to be not very beneficial in the long term. A absolutely. And not in all ways we perceive. So for you, it was gastrointestinal uh, upset. For other people, it's 
rheumatoid arthritis a year later. For other people, it's high blood sugars that you don't perceive until you are diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, cataracts, and kidney uh, disease. So it can, it's, what's, what's incredible, Tony, is the vast variety of ways that this thing inflicts its harm on humans. There's nothing wrong with wheat or grasses. They're beautiful plants. It, it's when humans try to eat them. There are certain things humans are simply not equipped to eat. One of the reasons why wheat is so toxic beyond the uh, change introduced by agribusiness is humans simply don't have the digestive apparatus to consume the seeds of grasses. You know, cows and sheep and goats and horses do, of course. They have a dental pad, which is a bony protuberance on the top of their mouth to grasp grasses. Yeah. They have teeth that grow continuously throughout their lives because grasses have sand-like particles in the blades and it erodes their teeth. They have a four-compartment stomach, one of which has a, a, a grinding function, and they also have unique microorganisms that allow them to break down the components of grasses like cellulose. They also have a spiral colon, unlike our little abbreviated couple of turn colons. In other words, in order to consume the grasses of the earth, you need very specific uh, adaptations developed over millions and millions of years. We have none of those. And yet we try to turn, I mean, think of it, in times of war, people have tried to eat grass, their seeds, the blades, the roots, etc. And it, inevitably they get sick. They have diarrhea, um, they throw it up, they have abdominal pain. If it passes through, it comes through completely undigested. Because humans, this remains true even of modern wheat, that many of the components, particularly the proteins, are indigestible. You can ingest them, but you cannot digest them. Wheat germagglutin, for instance, very co yeah. uh, a toxic compound in wheat, rye, barley, and rice, oddly, uh, is very toxic. It takes a milligram to wipe out the colon of a rat, and the average uh, uh, citizen in the U.S. and the U.K. consumes about 18 to 20 milligrams per day. Well, this protein is completely impervious to human digestion. It goes in intact, it comes out intact, but it does all kinds of weird things in its course from mouth to toilet, such as cause uh, gallbladder stasis, bile stasis, it blocks action of the pancreas to re release pancreatic enzymes. And those things, of course, lead to dysbiosis and disruption of digestion. And it also is highly toxic, directly toxic to the intestinal lining. So that's just one protein among the thousands of proteins in, in modern wheat that are toxic to humans. It's, it's, it's like kicking a baby, Tony. It's so easy to pick on wheat because there's, there's no end to the list of problems. But the astounding thing is, of course, it's held up as the most important thing in your diet, which is a completely absurd uh, notion. Mm. One of the things I think is quite interesting um, is I, I agree with you. And yet I think if I was to have kids, um, I know myself it's very hard to avoid gluten. There's sometimes I've eaten something and I've thought, uh, you know yourself, when you go out to a restaurant, they say, is it gluten-free? And they're like, yeah, 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 and then they'll bring it. It's definitely gluten-free. And they say, hang on a sec, and they go and ask the chef, and then they take it away again. I wonder how many times I've accidentally eaten gluten over the last four years. And I wonder with children, if someone's listening to this and they've got kids, and they are on board with your message. Is it good to expose kids to a bit of gluten, bearing in mind they probably will accidentally get exposed at some point? Because I feel now that if, if and when I do eat gluten, it would affect me even more severely than it used to. That is true. It's very observant. That's right. When you, when you get re-exposed, there are predictable re-exposure reactions. Your reaction is the most common. I have that too. You get yeah. diarrhea, abdominal distress. Other people get migraine headaches, uh, skin rash like seborrhea or psoriasis or eczema. Others get emotional effects, anger, suicidal thoughts, anxiety. Uh, there's a whole range of these exposures. You're asking an unsettled question. That, that is, no one really has examined this, taken a population of kids who were grain-free and then exposed them to see what happened. So no, no one's actually done that kind of research. But I will point out one thing, because this comes up frequently. Uh, pregnant moms, for instance, will say, is it okay to be pregnant and have a healthy baby while not eating grains? Or can I breastfeed and not eat? Well, I remind everybody that for the first 99.6% of our time on this planet, 99.6% of our time on this planet, we did not consume the seeds of grasses. 
We ate foods that are instinctively food. If you hadn't eaten for two weeks, you had to feed you and your family, you would know right away what to do, right? You'd kill a squirrel, you'd spear a deer, <laughs> and you'd, or you'd do something like that, or, or catch some fish, or gather some edible leaves. Yes. It'd be very instinctive what to do. No one would look at a field of grass and say, hallelujah, we're going to have dinner tonight. The, the, <laughs> grass is just not viewed as we. You know, it, it is, when you think of it, Tony, testimony to how clever humans can be, in spite of the mistakes we've made, yeah. to take the seeds of grasses, the little seeds at the top of this tall plant, isolate them, uh, remove them from the husk, the, the chaff, grind them, heat them, reconstitute them with water and other, other methods to make them edible. But no matter what you do, some things just should not be eaten, and the grass of the earth are just not suitable for human digestion. And weird stuff happens when you try to consume them. And that's why you can have diseases like uh, peripheral neuropathy or cerebellar ataxia or gluten encephalopathy, which is a fatal form of dementia that kills you within two years. So, uh, so, with, the, so with the kids, don't, don't feed them gluten. So it's natural for kids not to eat gluten. What's unnatural is to be exposed to, the, uh, to gluten, gliadin, glutenins, wheat germagglutin, amylopectin A, uh, th uh, uh, thyroreductases, serpents. In other words, the thousands of components of this thing called wheat and grains. So I, I think it's perfectly fine to have your children revert back to the way they were supposed to have eaten anyway. You know, before this, we made this mistake of less than one half of 1% of human history including the seeds of grasses. I think that's okay, and accept that there's going to be occasional um, exposures that are inadvertent, or your eight-year-old son goes to a birthday party, and he says, what the heck, I'm going to have a slice of birthday cake, but then has, has pays the price with diarrhea. You know, that can be a very useful lesson for that, for that child, right? Because he now understands that certain things simply do not belong in a diet. And by the way, those are the same kids who shun candy, and like broccoli and asparagus and Brussels sprouts and pork chops. So it, there's a wonderful, and kids, I love this, Tony, when you get rid of grains, something happens to taste perception. And you love Brussels sprouts. Ah. You don't need cake and candy. I love Brussels so, sprouts as well, but I do have a sweet tooth yeah. too. <laughs> <laughs> Brussels sprouts are the food of the gods. <laughs> <laughs> Well, another, a corollary to all this is to, to reject this idea of cutting fat and saturated fat. So you know that this idea of cutting total fat and saturated fat was ridiculous in the first place. The science was so flimsy. There were misinterpretations. There were political reasons for embracing that idea. And it became part of, an, at least in the U.S., the food pyramid, food plan, likewise dietary advice in the U.K., it was based on ridiculous science. It's all crumbled now. And oddly, very quietly, all those agencies are slowly retracting their message. The Institute of Medicine in the U.S. about three years ago now retracted all the advice mm -hmm. to limit dietary cholesterol and total fat. But it didn't make the headlines because there's too much of a vested interest in maintaining this low-fat franchise. Nabisco, Kraft, General Mills, all those companies make literally tens of hundreds of billions of dollars a year by uh, uh, selling products into the low-fat market. And so when official advice quietly retracts all that advice, no one talks about it. So it takes it takes yeah. a, a broadcast like yours to popularize these ideas. I, I wonder if it's also the fact that, let's say that these companies were to acknowledge that high-fat diets were you, you know, potentially good for the population. It's not just that. It's just that those low-fat ingredients are so cheap compared to the good saturated fats, good inverted commas, that they'd have to put in their products, which would be way more expensive if they're going to use good quality ingredients than what they're using now. Good point. Very good point. Yeah. So uh, one of the things I like about you is you're very outspoken about kind of big pharma and big food companies, and you don't hold back when you think something's not right. How much, what do you think of food companies in terms of the average American diet and the average world diet at the moment and what they're doing and what they're not doing? I, I fear, Tony, that big food and big pharma, big agribusiness and the medical device industry and the, and the healthcare industry, likewise, have become comfortable with predatory practices. You know, just as, just as this, this, this thing we're going through where uh, women are coming out and 
uh, exposing some of the sexual harassment they've been uh, experiencing and were squashed and kept in the dark for so long. Same thing here. The predatory practices of big food and big pharma. You know, the U.S., big pharma runs ads. If you watch the morning news, now two-thirds of commercials are for prescription drugs no way i mean that's insane yeah, that you even allow that that is insane because you have to get the, you have to go to your doctor and say i would like you to prescribe me right well the gullible do that exactly right i think i hope most people who have their eyes open just turn it off or just fail to watch network and cable tv now because it's so dominated which by the way means if a guy like you wants to come on american tv they won't let you because Big Pharma is so influential now in driving ad revenues that they will not host messages like yours or mine. So they'll host, if you if you want to talk about low fat. You must have been on morning TV talking about your book. Uh, years back, when it was weak belly, now that I've converted over time to this undoctored type message, that is, you and I can enjoy magnificent health and that is superior to the kind of ridiculous health the doctor tries to dispense. Um, uh, that message is unfriendly to big pharma. And so uh, uh, messages like this are no longer welcome on, on TV. That's what we're up against. That with the big money interests like big pharma, big food, now control the message, which is horrifying. You know, in, in a world, UK and US, where we pride ourselves on freedom of speech, big business has essentially squashed freedom of speech. So this is why what you're doing is so critical because it's getting the message out to people because in the US, ABC, NBC, CBS are not doing it. They have abdicated their responsibility to report, you know, healthcare is a disaster in the US. I'm, I'm shocked when people say, oh, the US has the finest healthcare system in the world. No, it doesn't. It's not even close. We're last, dead last in uh, westernized countries like the Netherlands and France and the UK and Canada. We are dead last. We get the least for our $3 trillion. <laughs> that is spent mm. on health care. Yet they run ads for, for drugs on TV that can tip commonly cost $3,000 to $10,000 a month. That's what's happening in the U.S. And so, but despite those problems, you know, if you have hepatitis C, even though it's inactive, a primary care doctor here can write you a prescription for Sovaldi or Harvoni. Those are the two drugs for hepatitis C. One vial, Tony, one vial of 120 tablets. You take that little prescription to the pharmacist, to the druggist, and he charges you $84,000 to $94,000. And that's not you paying it. That's the insurance company paying it. Well, that's the insurance company paying that we all end up sharing. Yeah. And that's why healthcare insurance costs in the U.S. are still growing at unbelievable rates. Drug costs are growing at 22% per year. In other words, it's crippling, but that money, it's not, it's not, a, it's that money is being transferred from the public's pockets into the big farmers' pockets. So healthcare has become, oddly, this enormously successful wealth transfer mm. from the public into the pockets of people who are, I'm not talking about the nurse or the LPN who's wheeling somebody. I'm talking about the decision makers, the people who are properly positioned to get the big, big payoffs that is the executives in big pharma, medical device industry. Even the doctors, the doctors make sure they're positioned for a big payoff. So it's this, and, and, and it, this is all exaggerated in the US. It's bad in the UK, but it's worse here mm. because of lack of restraint, politics, and this idea that business will solve all problems, which is completely untrue, of course, because people are greedy, and greed has become this unspoken theme in healthcare. So it does occur to me if, the big food companies or the big pharmaceutical companies actually more relevant um, were to say come up with a one-time treatment that um, would eradicate certain illnesses or diseases or problems and would be very cheap <laughs> like getting rid of gluten intolerance for example it might be against their interests to actually market it that's one of the problems with with these super powerful companies isn't it Absolutely. So a dream come true for big pharma is to develop an expensive drug that you require chronically, like uh, statin drugs for high cholesterol, which is a whole 
that's a whole podcast of its own, right? The, yes. the scam called statin drugs and high cholesterol, which has nothing to do with heart disease, by the way, yeah. though they meant to persuade us that. So that that but that's their darling. They want long term chronic issues. Pneumonia, that's a big yawn, right? That's antibiotics for a couple of weeks, and who cares about that? So that's why you see all the funds being diverted away from short term therapies to long term chronic therapies. They want the lifestyle diseases. Uh, which, of course, but lifestyle diseases are caused by lifestyle. And the solution is not three pages of new drugs. It's just don't engage in the practices and lifestyle that cause these things in the first place. So all these diseases now that are rampant in modern society, hypertension, high cholesterol, hypertriglyceridemia, fatty liver, type 2 diabetes, obesity, psoriasis, seborrhea, etc., are all caused by uh, diet and some of the nutrient deficiencies that, get, that either result from that diet or simply result of the deficiency of, mo of modern life, like vitamin D and magnesium. But correct them, Tony, and people and 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 tell people about them, and they are given extraordinary, magnificent control over health at virtually no cost or very little cost. This podcast specifically focuses on energy, and one of the things I like is that some people listen and they have got real problems you know perhaps a, an incurable illness or dis but other people they're just interested in the extra kind of two or five percent um presumably you would recommend them looking at gluten if they are eating gluten wheat as a way of achieving that extra two or five percent yeah i would caution everybody though to not just view this as a gluten issue so for instance corn Corn is a seed of a grass also. People forget that because they see it as the cob, but the cob is actually a very bizarre mutation of the seed head of the teosinte and maize plant. If you saw a picture of teosinte, it looks like a grass. It's just a wild growing grass. Uh, uh, so corn, of course, is gluten-free, meaning it doesn't have the protein gluten in it. It has a protein called zein that looks a lot like gluten, actually the gliadin subcomponent of gluten. And so that's why when people with celiac disease, for instance, eat gluten-free foods made with corn starch, it's corn starch, not corn protein, but the corn starch is contaminated by zein protein. That's why many people with celiac disease have their disease reactivated by gluten-free foods. That is, that is the status of modern mm. health advice for most doctors. That is, follow a gluten-free diet, eat gluten-free foods, of the kind that reactivates your celiac disease. So, <laughs> so that's why I remind everybody, it's really not gluten-free, but grain-free. So millet has no gluten in it. It just sends your blood sugar sky high, as do oats. So, you know, I'm, I'm waiting, Tony, for the day when Apple Watch or Apple or somebody else comes out with a yeah. continuous glucose monitoring watch. Yeah. Because that will be a dietary game changer. All those people who think they're doing a good job, for instance, by eating stone ground, uh, organic oatmeal, but see that one bowl of oatmeal without sugar makes you a type 2 diabetic within minutes. They'll realize just how awful this ridiculous advice is. So that when that finally comes out, it'll be a, an incredible game changer. And I think uh, 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 broadcasts like your podcast will have no no room at all for people to because everyone's going to be clamoring for your kind of message. You can't argue with us now. <laughs> <laughs> what what, um, what do you think? Obviously, you're kind of fairly on board with a lowish sugar diet. What do you think about ketosis? I think ketosis is a great thing. Uh, it's physiologic, of course. My only concern is the people who do these ketogenic diets for a long period. We saw we we have two experiences to learn from. One is the Adkins experience. That's a low fat, essentially ketotic program, right? Yeah. So I saw many, many, many people do this, and you can find this over and over again in the Adkins community. They, they go low carb, they lose weight, their fatty liver reverses, their diabetes goes away. They get off insulin, oral drugs for diabetes, blood pressure drops. They look great. And then about 18 months or so in, they start getting constipation. Their HDL drops. Their triglycerides start to climb. Their blood pressure goes up. Their blood sugar goes up. Of course, people then accuse them of not sticking to the program, but they, but they are. This is because of uh, disruptions of bowel flora. When you're super low carb or ketogenic, you're not taking in prebiotic fibers that nourish bowel flora. And you get dysbiosis. Long term, you get other things like diverticular disease 
and colon cancer. So it's a very serious issue. We also, so we had the Adkins less than the Drawfin. We also have this issue, this crazy issue of kids, thousands of them in clinical studies who were put on ketogenic diets to suppress intractable seizures. And it works. There's a 50 to 80% reduction in seizures and they stop growing. They fall off the growth curve. They fall in the fifth percentile for growth. And they get constipated. They develop metabolic distortions. There's an occasional sudden cardiac death, cardiomyopathy, selenium deficiency. Um, in other words, there's something wrong with chronic long-term ketosis. I think you can remedy the problems with ketogenesis just by adding prebiotic fibers and going off ketosis. And it's, I look at, at ketosis kind of like stress. If you like the stress response, because you're a, you're a, you're a uh, adrenaline junkie, and so you seek out stress all the time, well, that be, now the stress response, a normal physiological response, becomes unhealthy. Yeah, funny stuff starts to happen when you're chronically stressed, like in a divorce or financial ruin. Bad things happen with chronic stress. Likewise, ketosis is physiologic. But it's meant to be an intermittent response. It's not meant to be an around-the-clock, 24-7 response. And when you do that, <clears throat> now, granted, the kid, the experience with kids and seizures, it has, it doesn't fully apply. For instance, some of those diets meant these kids drank corn oil, which, of course, is horrible. Um, yeah. But there's still lessons to learn, and there's uncertainties that apply. And this worries me because there are now programs introducing ketotic diets on a large scale, not accounting for prebiotic fibers and not allowing for the nutrient deficiency, deficiencies that can develop in uh, keto in chronic ketosis. Okay, that's given me, I, I kind of am um, intermittently in ketosis. That's given me quite a lot to think about, actually. Um, you know, Tony, it could be as simple as having a glass of wine. You can break your, keto your, your ketosis. So oh, it's well, not yeah, that, I wouldn't worry about that. Yeah. I'm not very strict about it. In fact, it'll probably be music to most people's ears because it is so hard to stay in ketosis all the time that um, I, I often I like to justify to myself that if, you know, it's all right if you come out in the evening, the next day you'll be back in it. So that's, that's one way of doing it, I suppose. Um, and, and you briefly mentioned fertility before. Do you, do you think that gluten, wheat, and corn, and some of the other grains that you mentioned are uh, have a negative effect on fertility for men and women? No question. And it's not just one thing. It's not just the gliadin or the gluten. It's also the growth of visceral fat. You know, visceral fat, tummy fat, is very inflammatory, and that alone is extremely hormonally disruptive. So a typical case would be a guy who's got the, the wheat belly, visceral fat, and visceral fat is weird. It expresses an enzyme called aromatase. An aromatase takes male testosterone and, and converts it to estrogen. So these guys with the big tummies have uh, low testosterone, low libido, high estrogen, red faces, and large breasts. Oh. Compounded even further, uh, the gliadin protein of wheat, rye, and barley uh, upon partial digestion, because it can't be completely digested, yields something called the A5 pentapeptide. It's a 5-amino acid peptide, and it is a powerful provocateur of prolactin. Prolactin, prolactation, it makes your breasts grow. Oh. So guys get man boobs. So these guys have big tummies and big breasts. And it's very, very embarrassing for guys to have this. They yeah, can't go out yeah. to the beach. Kids make fun of them. I mean, real, real, weird stuff. This is all from grains. Likewise, in women, we see the most exaggerated hormonal disruptions in uh, women who are, in about the 15% of women who are prone to polycystic ovarian syndrome. Mm. So fairly common. These ladies, when they consume grains, grow also visceral fat that's also hormonal disruptive and inflammatory, they get higher estrogen than they're supposed to, which is a breast cancer risk, by the way. They get high testosterone, and for that reason, they grow facial hair. Some of them actually grow beards, and they become infertile. They have magnificent responses to this lifestyle, Tony. They lose the weight, their tummy fat dissolves, their hypertension goes away, the type 2 diabetes that's very characteristic of this con condition goes away, their facial hair recedes, estrogen drops back to normal, testosterone drops back to normal, and they have children. So we've had many, many uh, mom, uh, ladies become moms on this lifestyle 
just because they got rid of all those hormonal distortions. So yes, so grain consumption due to amylopectin A, due to gliadin, due to wheat germ or gluten, due to, due to its many, many components, uh, contributes to hormonal disruption, including infertility. Wow. Do you find that your message is, uh, it's still controversial for many? Have you, have you, do you feel like kind of powerful forces are arranged against you at times? Oh, absolutely. There's no question, Tony. That's why I'm grateful for what you're doing and, and other podcasters and people who want to just talk about the truth because uh, network TV doesn't want to talk about this. Uh, uh, major magazines don't want to talk about this. So we have to get it out. It, it's this age where money controls the message. We see that so often now. It, the, the, one of the big tragedies is that uh, healthcare care much more so in the U.S., is an absolute disaster. When you enter the healthcare system, you are exposing yourself to an incredibly predatory uh, industry. And I see this happen all the time. People go to the hospital for one thing. I, I've seen this just recently. Someone goes into the hospital with a shoulder pain because they were gardening. They want to make sure it's not something more serious. It's just shoulder pain from gardening. But they go in, they end up with a heart catheterization, an electrophysiologic study, a tilt study, neurologic a neurology consult, uh, five, six, seven day hospitalization, $170,000 bill for shoulder pain. They leave really? with a prescription for naproxen. Oh yeah, this happens all the time because when they, when they see you have a nice uh, healthcare insurance card, they will milk you for all it's worth. Here, here's how doctors are employed in the U.S. now, more often than not. They're, they're hired as employees of a hospital, but they're told, doctor, the more revenue you generate for our, your hospital system, the larger your end of quarter bonus so it's a difference in bonus of, let's say, $10,000 versus $150,000. Mm. So guess what my colleagues do? They churn you. So if a nice guy like you comes in with a headache, you've got an MRI, a lumbar tap, neurology consultation, EEG. In other words, this kind of watch and wait or nice see your primary care doctor and just kind of do the natural, normal things, that's all gone. It is a predatory system bent on extracting maximum revenue. So uh, the the rules are all distorted here, uh, much more so in the U.S. It's yeah. bad in the U.K. too. I have friends in the U.K. who tell me similar things are going on, just not quite to the extravagant level that's going on here. Yeah. So that's why it's important we talk about these things, that you can get rid of chronic disease by addressing diet and a handful of nutrient deficiencies and engaging in some simple practices like trying to buy organic foods rather than pesticide and herbicide and GMO foods. Simple practices like that, Tony, and people are given extraordinary, extraordinary uh, control over their diet. The sad thing is the last person you should talk to about being healthy is your doctor. The doctor is the most ignorant one in the room. So I suspect if you go to your doctor, you find your knowledge of nutrition is encyclopedic compared to his little one page worth of nutritional insight. <laughs> mm. <laughs> that is the current step. That is the modern status quo. Yeah. It's kind of depressing, isn't it? Because we respect our doctors so much. It's kind of almost the last position of authority that people genuinely look up to. I, I think that's good. If you're in a car accident, you crack your head open and they need to drain your hemorrhage. I mean, there are times and places when these things are necessary. But this idea that a nice guy like you needs to be on cholesterol drugs, blood pressure drugs, uh, colonoscopies, all this surveillance testing is a bunch of nonsense. In other words, we give people the wrong advice and diet, not us, but I mean uh, uh, nationally. Yeah. Cause diseases like type 2 diabetes, heart disease and dementia, and then we step in to treat you for it. That's, that's the modern yeah, status quo in healthcare. So that's why I, I think what you and I are trying to do is tell people, no, 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 no. You don't have to submit to that kind of ridiculous notion. You actually have extraordinary care of your own health if you just have a handful of, uh, of, of insights. So one question I've asked everyone on this podcast is, what is one book that you would recommend and one tip for living with more energy? Uh, so one book and one tip. What book has had an impact on you or do you think might have an impact on other people? I don't know if your viewers will share my interest, but there's a fabulous book that didn't get enough attention called Catching Fire by Richard Wrangham, Wrangham, W-R-A-N-G-H-A-M, an anthropologist. And because he recounts the history of eating in light of fire and cooking and food. Oh, wow. And sheds, 
yeah, he sheds a lot of light on the, the things we do today in the context of millions of years of, of eating. And it also helps you understand why humans are the way they are, why we have a short colon and long, small intestines and don't have incisors uh, and why we are such effective group hunters. I mean, it sheds light and understanding on this idea of paleo eating or pre-Neolithic uh, lifestyles. So that's one of my favorite. That sounds great. Uh, advice for, for health. Um, and energy in particular. Well, that's a, I got Z zestiness, <laughs> zestiness in particular. <laughs> well, it would be grain elimination. I mean, there's so much more to do now, but grain elimination is, uh, to this day, Tony, I still am sobered and humbled by how powerful that strategy can be. When you see people who are 200 pounds overweight, weighed down by two, three, four pages of prescription drugs, feel awful because the drugs don't work and they have lots of side effects, and the next visit to the doctor ends up with two more prescriptions. Uh, and when you see that person come back in a size four dress, off their medications, skin rashes gone, now jumping rope, going to Zumba, and just realizing how many years they lost. Mm. When, when, this is a daily uh, experience for me, the people, the legions of people who undergo these kinds of, so we're not talking about losing five pounds and cutting calories. We're talking about a, a, a truly, without exaggerating, a, a broad and powerful change in health as well as weight just from the grain elimination. There's more to do, but that's a great start. And we've, we've mentioned dog, uh, not dogs, uh, drugs and <laughs> doctors. You can see how I arrived at dogs there, can't you? Um, we've mentioned drugs and doctors quite a bit. Do you recommend that people see an alternative kind of functional medicine practitioner or something like that? And, and if so, how would you recommend they find one? Yeah, you're exactly right. So my criticism of my colleagues refers to the mainstream doctors. But there are champions in this, and that is people like the naturopaths, the chiropractors, functional medicine, integrative health practitioners. Uh, you know, sadly, I think it's true in the UK, too. You still are left to such uh, primitive means as word of mouth. Uh, you can Google these things. The Institute of Functional Medicine, for instance, has a geographic locating device on their website. You can do those kinds of things. I think I believe it's worldwide, too. Uh, they're a start. Uh, and the functional medicine community is growing. I don't agree with everything they do, but there's lots of great ideas. But at least they're, they're trying to ask this question. If you have a health problem, why do you have it? Can we correct the cause, not just throw drugs and procedures at it? So I think that's a great idea. Dr. Davis, thank you so much for coming on Zestology. I appreciate it, and especially your passion for your subject as well. Um, where can people find out more about you and, of course, your books as well? Well, my, my pleasure, Tony. And I, I want you to keep doing what you're doing because you're doing uh, people a great service uh, that has not been it's not being performed by major media. So keep doing what you're doing. Thank you. But people can find my stuff on my Wheat Belly blog, Wheat Belly on Facebook. There's uh, Undoctored blog. Um, I have a membership website called Undoctored Inner Circle. If people want to get deep, more deeply into it, and we do these kinds of things. By the way, we have group video meetings. And all our efforts to cultivate bowel flow, which, by the way, is proven to be a kick-ass, huge factor. Is it? You've been following yeah. my crazy yogurt conversation? No. You're kind of young. So this is this is more for like 45 years old and older. Yeah. Well, I'm 44 but, in two days' time, so give, oh, it, a, well, give it a year. <laughs> <laughs> so, real quick. So, there's a, it started with some studies at MIT. A, a cancer group exploring this species called Lactobacillus reuteri a very specific strain, because you have to pay attention to strains, called ATCC, PTA6475, and DSM17938. <laughs> very specific strains. You give them to mice. So one, one of their studies, mice. Give mice a shitty diet. Crap, all crap foods, right? Control mice, get fat. Diabetic, they lose their hair. They get old. They stop playing with each other. They stop grooming each other. Stop mating, Right? Mice given same shitty diet and lactobacillus reuteri, ATCC, PTA6475. Just an organism. Yeah. They stay slender their entire lives. Thick hair, thick skin. They play with each other. They groom each other. They no mate way. like that. 
they so they didn't it didn't extend life, Tony, but the Lactobacillus rotari mice stayed young until death. Yeah, stayed young until death. Tell me that's not goddamn cool. <laughs> And now this has since been corroborated, multiple fats, not all of it, a lot of it has been corroborated in humans. Dramatic increase in skin thickness, dermal collagen, you know, uh, accelerated, I'm sorry, uh, 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 increased bone density, increased testosterone dramatically, uh, better engagement, better empathy for other humans, thicker hair, Unbelievable stuff. Wrinkles disappearing. And I'm talking about within weeks. It's the, the effect is dramatic. A lot of ladies, for instance, will take collagen hydrolysates yeah. to reduce wrinkles as well as to rebuild cartilage. Well, you do that every day consistently for a year. You get a teensy-weensy effect. You out, out, outstrip that effect within days of doing this. And how do we and find so, this? So it's oddly... The, the, these strains are patented. And I didn't know you could patent live work. If I, I can't patent you if I wanted to, right? Yeah. How can we patent live work? That's Somehow they logged up these strains, like 180 patents. So they some just, I think they know a patent for a process, that kind of stuff. So the patents are held by BioGaia, B-I-O-G-A-I-A, a Swedish company. Mm. They'll sell it to you. Uh, uh, the problem with what they sell you is the counts are real low. A, a million, I'm sorry, 100 million CFUs, 100 million bacteria of each strain, which sounds like a lot, but it's not. It's very little. You know, most probiotics are tens of billions. Now we're getting to the hundreds of billions and even trillions. So 100 million CFUs is very, very small quantity. And when all of us took it, nothing happened. Or it's really slow. So I made yogurt, not because yogurt's wonderful. Yogurt's an amplifying mechanism for bacterial counts. And if you ferment for about 36 hours, given the doubling time of this species, you get about a trillion counts in yogurt. But we make the yogurt in a very specific way. First of all, we start with high fat, some high fat starting uh, material. Like I use, I don't, I don't know what you call it in the UK, but we call it half and half. It's half cream, half milk. Yeah, I, I think we probably call it something similar. Or okay. maybe, maybe single so, cream or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's 18% fat. Okay. Start organic half and half. Add prebiotic fibers to the yogurt. Okay. Like raw potato starch or inulin. And then you add some source of the organism. For, first time you do it, you crush 10 tablets. You add that. Subsequent batches, you can use the prior batch. You can use a few tablespoons of the prior batch. And then you keep it at 110 degrees by some means. A yogurt maker, um... Do you have instant pots there? Yeah, 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 we do. Instant pots will do it. Or a slow Some cooker. Slow cookers will do it. I just use my oven. I turn the oven on for a minute, turn it off, do that every few hours. And, and you want you want to let it ferment for about 36 hours. You eat a half cup a day. This is all, by the way, it's all my wheat belly block. Yeah. Eat a half a cup a day. First effect you're going to experience is complete disinterest in food. Complete, Tony. Not like, eh. I and mean, you can taste food. Food still tastes good, but you will be completely indifferent to food. So it is a magnificent facilitator of fasting if you want to. Uh, well, I quite like food, though. Oh, it doesn't mean you won't like food. It just means that, and this this effect is more prominent the more overweight you are. So you're not going to have much of that effect. Okay, cool. It's called the anorexogenic effect. Okay. But you, I, I, the reason I point that out is if you get the anorexogenic effect, you know you've boosted oxytocin. Yeah. And that's what's responsible for all these effects. Increased bone density, increased skin thickness, accelerated healing, uh, increased testosterone, on and on and on. Uh, and I've seen this play out in, in, in real people. E every week I do this virtual meetup online like this with uh, people from all over, you know, there's Mary from Rochester and Chester from Thailand, and we're all sharing our experiences. And every week, most of the ladies, ladies are better at making observations on skin health, are reporting reduction in skin wrinkles, reduction in neck wrinkles. I had a woman who had exposed veins from taking prednisone for many years, gone within three weeks. Uh, ladies who get the senile purpura, the blotchy purple spots on their skin with any little minor touch or trauma. Right. Gone. 
I, I mean, it's all astounding. because of crazy yogurt. All because of this crazy organism that we amplify via the yogurt. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah, it's, it's are, crazy. Are you, are, you, are you having the crazy yogurt every day? I've cut back to every other day because I got sick and tired of making yogurt all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You need someone to actually persuade someone to sell the yogurt ready-made. I'd pay a fortune for it right now. Well, you know, I, I'm talking to people about that. I, I don't really have any interest. I got enough to do. But I, I've got people who are, are wanting to do that, so we'll see if that happens or not. But um, when, you, when you eat the yogurt and you, you essentially seed your intestines with this species, a strain, you have it for more than a day. So I mean, you don't have to eat it every day. But, so I, I think you're probably fine eating it every other day or every third or fourth day, something like that. You know, we're still at the edges of what's known about this thing. But it is uh, – I wouldn't say it's as big as grain elimination or vitamin D. Vitamin D is number two as – among the biggest things I've ever seen uh, that yields health. This is, I would say, probably number three. I don't take vitamin D. Do you think everyone should take it? Oh, ass kicking. <laughs> Tony, it is yeah. huge. Oh, yeah. You're, you, well, you live in the UK, right? Yeah. You're very far north. You have the latitude of Canada. And so your uh, vitamin D level is probably rock bottom. Um, and, of course, you're a nice... Uh, uh, um, law-abiding citizen you wear clothes in public <laughs> you probably don't eat that much liver so yeah you gotta get vitamin vitamin d is is an ad when i when i first started supplementing vitamin d uh, when in patients when I, when I had my practice about 12 years ago tony that alone is a huge effect i used to be incapacitated by seasonal affective disorder you did you know what this yeah yeah i get up in the morning you know it's dark out I, oh I could barely talk. I could barely function sometimes. Vitamin D, gone, gone, obliterated, and reduced potential for autoimmune diseases, dramatic reductions in potential for diabetes, um, heart disease, dementia. Very few things have been shown to have an impact on cognitive decline. Yeah. Vitamin D, top of the list. Yeah. Well, and, when, and do you take it in the morning or any time? I think it's best, as you know, to mimic the way it's done in nature. So vitamin D is, is essentially sun exposure. Mm. So it seems to be a little better taken in the, in the, in the morning. Yeah. It sometimes keeps people awake at night if you take it at bedtime. Yeah. Uh, and the dose for a guy like, you, you, you're probably what, six feet tall? Yeah, six one. Yeah. So probably 6,000 units a day. Wow. Three 2,000 unit gel caps. I don't know what you have available there, but I'm pretty sure I have no Gel caps, so you've got like liquid or various different things you can have. Yeah. Gel caps are very consistently absorbed. Tablets, almost unabsorbable. Drops, wildly erratic. I, I, I tracked 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels okay. in thousands and thousands of people over many years. And you just learn these lessons. Yeah. You learn that oil-based gel caps reliably, consistently absorb. Tablets, virtually no absorption or wild erratic absorption. And then drops. You just get wild. So I think you're going to use nanomoles per liter uh, value. So you want 150, 180 nanomoles per liter. Or our, the, the old antiquated U.S. system, uh, 60 to 70 nanograms per milliliter. And that takes typically 6,000 units per day for, for most people. There's also genetic variation. So at some point, if you can get your uh, NHS doc to check your 25 hydroxy vitamin D level would be nice. Uh, well, that's probably not something you'd go to the NHS for, but, uh, but I'd be oh, well up for gosh. checking it. Yeah. Thank you so much. I've got a feeling some people are going to be giving up certain parts of their diet after listening to this. <laughs> That's great, Tony. That's it. Thank you to Dr. William Davis for his time. And if you've been inspired by this podcast to give up gluten, put down the pies and the bread rolls and the cakes and everything else, then let me know. It's not easy, but I tell you what, after a while, it is quite easy. And I would say the other thing is that it kind of takes you out of the line of fire when all sorts of mischievous goodies get, you know, if it's someone's birthday and there's a load of cakes in the office, you just don't eat it and you don't end up eating the rubbish that gives you a sugar spike for about 20 minutes and then a massive low. And all in all, I've not looked back. I definitely feel good for not being on gluten and I think it's probably helped. As always, thank you for listening to Zestology. Really appreciate it. If you'd like the three zesty things email, you can head to tonywriting.com and uh, that'd be fantastic. And if you'd 
like to improve your focus, productivity and creativity, you might want to check out mine and Dr. Stephen Simpson's course, IWantToUnplug.com. It's all about using the skills of NLP to unplug and reduce your technological addictive tendencies. Um, I want to unplug.com. Use the code Zestology and you get 30% off on that. And more to the point, you'll get to use some NLP skills, which is quite fun. We look at logical levels and perceptual positions and all these kind of quite technical NLP terms and hopefully make them a bit more fun and easy to use. So that is I want to unplug.com. That's it from me. Um, I'm going to continue my walk around this park in London and I will speak to you next time.